this is my official welcome good evening all of you to the weekly huddle my name is anup agrawal i am an interventional cardiologist at care hospital hyderabad i am joined in this huddle by my colleague and co-host for the session dr pranith kolamuri he is also an interventional cardiologist at care hospital in banjara hills uh, most of the audience here they have attended huddle before uh, but uh, the first time join is i'm just going to give a brief introduction of what the weekly huddle is and then we'll get started so the weekly huddle is an audience level interactive session where we discuss a variety of things mostly focused around healthcare and particularly a clinical topic we typically pick uh, a topic or a clinical case and then we restrict our audio discussion around that uh, it doesn't have a video doesn't have a powerpoint presentation it's basically just sharing our thoughts the basic premise of the huddle is to bring our casual hallway discussions to a more organized platform like this one and share our ideas uh, while we do want to talk about science the huddle aims to bring out our practice patterns and understand the rationale of what makes us take a particular decision so it's more of a thought sharing exercise rather than practice changing exercise uh, and of course uh, we do want to talk about uh, the guidelines and science and everything the weekly huddle is hosted every week on wednesdays at 7:30 pm like the one today we typically run about 2 3 4 minutes late based upon uh, how that in these join today is our 25th session we have been doing it every week and uh, when we started about 6 months ago i wasn't sure how long this is going to go uh, but so far the response has been reasonable and uh, now we are on our 25th session and we are hoping that we are going to continue this uh, at least uh, till we can our topic of discussion for today is uh, obstructive sleep apnea uh, to facilitate the discussion for today i am joined by some of my colleagues uh, and uh, we'll have uh, physicians from various backgrounds like uh, internal medicine critical care pulmonologist cardiologist among others i do want to emphasize that the huddle is not a speaker and audience model rather an audience level interaction which means any of the attendees can raise their hand or unmute themselves to give their input as a courtesy you should wait for others to finish their thoughts before you unmute yourself so with that i will start with uh, today's clinical case i typically ask uh, praneet to share his uh, thoughts on the case first and then i open it for discussion for everybody else <clears throat> so and most of the time when i bring up a case in some form we have seen these cases in our clinical practice so these are not made up cases they are they are real patients and we try to focus our discussion uh, around this particular case itself while sharing our thoughts so praneet my clinical case to you is and i would like to get your input first and then we'll open it for uh, discussion so this is a 42 year old male he has been diagnosed hypertensive about Three years ago, and since then he had been getting therapy from an outside physician. Uh, he currently does not have any symptoms. He does not have any other comorbidities to report. He works in a software uh, agency, and his lifestyle is more or less that of ours, where he would be he wouldn't be considered sedentary, but he is not very active. uh he comes to see you because his blood pressure is not controlled on the current drugs that he is taking he does not have any symptoms though the medicines that he is taking is uh, telmisartan and amlodipine and i'm trying to come to the crux of the case discussion so that i don't take much of the time and we'll spend more time in discussion so he's taking 40 mg of telmisartan daily and 5 mg of amlodipine daily his blood pressure in your office is 150 over 100 with a heart rate of about 80s and this is pretty much consistent with the blood pressure reading that he gets at home while you discuss with him all the other history and all the precipitating factors and everything you also discover that he has a history of heavy snoring uh, he has got some daytime somnolence but he has never met into an accident and he is able to continue with his daytime work without any problem you also notice that he is obese his bmi in the office that you calculated was 30 uh you put him on uh, a thiazide diuretic you gave him some behavioral modification instruction 
you asked him to check blood pressure at home, and you also advised him to do a sleep study because of his snoring, weight, uh, resistant blood pressure, and all those. Uh, and you asked him to come after a month. So he comes after a month. His blood pressure is slightly better. Uh, he has been taking the medication that you prescribed, and he gets a sleep study. And I'm going to tell you the very basic result of sleep study, but I have the entire study with me, so you can ask a particular question if you need to. In the sleep study, the very pertinent findings are his AHI, or apnea hypopnea index, was reported to be 32, with apnea episode of 9 and hypopnea episode of 23. His SpO2 nadir was 82, which means that is the lowest that his oxygen dropped. Uh, and most of them, they lasted for a few seconds. Uh, his rhythm throughout the study was normal. And he said this study was done at his home where he was feeling okay. There wasn't anything in particular about this study. So he wants to discuss with you the results of this study because that's what you called him for. Uh, and of course, you will be discussing other hypertension uh, related uh, uh, behavioral modifications and whatnot. But we are going to limit our discussion on this. So my question to you is, Pranit, how do you interpret this sleep study? What are you going to recommend to him? And what realistically are you expecting out of your therapy in terms of what would be your clinical, uh, in a way, clinical endpoint to say that your therapy is working? So, Pranit, about this case. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Anup. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, uh, my uh, understanding of the clinical case is uh, AHI uh, more than uh, 5 is uh, significant. So, this patient definitely falls into uh, severe uh, form of uh, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Though we know, don't know the level of obstruction, but it can be somewhere from upper respiratory to lower respiratory tract. So all throughout, there is some obstruction presuming that his upper airway is okay no dns uh, sinus etc are being <clears throat> ruled out we i presume he to be having the obesity related uh, obstructive sleep apnea contributing to the resistant hypertension kind of a picture or the etiology of hypertension so uh, i would uh, advise him to start uh, positive airway ventilation the cpap or bipap uh, taking the consultation of a pulmonologist, uh, referring to a pulmonologist to suggest him about the best method of a positive airway pressure. And the clinical goal would be to uh, adequately control the hypertension and probably reduce the dosage of hypertension. The goal would be to control hypertension. And if the obstructive CPAP is the contributing factor and it can, it's taken care of, uh, hoping that the amount of antihypertensive drugs uh, do come down. Uh, also emphasizing on reducing weight, etc., which is always there. So, Pranit, my question to you is, <clears throat> realistically speaking, hmm. um, while when you prescribe CPAP therapy for him, we expect that his snoring may get better, we expect that his daytime uh, somnolence, uh, will uh, somnolence will get better, yeah. But uh, how much do you think it will affect his blood pressure per se? I think blood pressure also uh, comes down. I, I believe the blood pressure also comes down uh, if okay. the patient is compliant with CPAP. Therapy. And what do you mean by compliant? Like every night or you think they can cheat? And... Every night, uh, or at least most of the days, maybe skipping a day or two is probably okay. But... Uh, Almost every night, uh, I would ask. I expect him to put it every night. Okay, perfect. So let us. Uh, I, I think the stage is set for us to start discussion. Uh, I asked Dr. Rafi, he's our pulmonologist, to join. For some reason, he is not in the uh, group yet. So I'm. Uh, let me pick up Dr. Pawan Reddy. He's our intensivist at uh, Kier Banjara. Uh, Dr. Pawan, if I could get your uh, pulmonology, if I could have you put on your pulmonology hat and uh, resolve this Pranith's referral, this patient comes to you for CPAP therapy. How much do you agree with Pranith's assessment? And uh, what can you do to help this patient out? Dr. Pawan. Yeah. Um, uh, am I audible, I believe? Yes, sir, you are audible, absolutely. Yeah. 
So yeah, so the basic uh, issue like what Pranit said, uh, I would concur in that point that uh, yeah, AHI 5, 15, 30, these numbers are important. Anything less than 5 is normal. This basically it is like apnea index. So if you stop breathing for more than 5 seconds, that is counted as one event. So how many times does it, for 10 seconds, if you stop breathing for 10 seconds, it is counted as one per hour. So how many times you do that, you go into apnea or hypopnea, uh, that is counted in the AHI index. So if you are stopping your breathing for 10 seconds, uh, for less, more than five times, that is significant uh, in one hour. So five is for mild, five to 15 is more, 15 to 30 is moderate. Anybody over 30 events such as that, is considered as severe. So for moderate and severe, we, we would advise uh, to use a CPAP machine. It's very important uh, to tell the patient why you are prescribing it and what are the complications if a person wouldn't use it. So most of the time the compliance problems comes in is basically because they're not used to it and they don't understand what will happen in future if they don't use it. Uh, the difficulty is that we see most of the time is that these patients do not really understand the complications, that is the heart failure, the right heart failure, and PAH and other problems that come in. Uh, diet modification, lifestyle modification, if you smoke or stop smoking, drinking alcohol, losing weight, changing sleeping position, they will all help it. CPAP for moderate to severe, definitely this guy comes in uh, severe because he's got 31 or more than 30 uh, AHI index. So he will definitely need uh, to be on a CPAP machine. So, but we have to tell them why this is required. So if you tell them that these are the complications, this is what it is going to cause, you are going to develop a PH, you are going to develop a heart failure later on, and that is going to worsen your situation more. And that is something that you have to drill in their head to improve the compliance. Most often than not, we tell them, they ask, we ask them to get a machine, they go around and see the cost of the machine, they'll get it for rent, use it for five days in there. So I think uh, it is very important for us to make them understand the reason for what. Hypertension develops because of the slight increase in the carbon dioxide, uh, the lack of sleep that they get uh, overnight. All these contribute to the increase in PCO2. The PCO2 jump will cause headache, light headedness, and uh, all this put together, the overnight stress, everything adds up to produce the hypertension. So if the carbon dioxide starts to come now, hypertension comes down. So if they are regularly using very well good compliance that even the hypertension comes down. So it's basically about the CO2 levels. Once the CO2 starts building up, uh, they start developing the hypertension more significantly. If you can combat it by use of CPAP, if the carbon dioxide levels come now, the hypertension will also get controlled. And definitely weight loss, uh, encouraging them at the early stage will help. But if somebody is already developed a severe, it is very important. Uh, it will become a very important algorithm to uh, decrease the carbon dioxide levels, decrease the limitation of uh, worsening pH over the, over the multiple, over, over the future course of illness. Uh, thank you, Pawan, sir. I have this uh, case open for discussion. If anybody in the audience wants to share their thoughts, they are most welcome. Uh, either you can raise your hands or uh, uh, you can unmute yourself. Uh, I will start inviting uh, suggestions from individuals. Uh, while I give a minute or so for the audience to gather their thought, I do want to share the reason why uh, we are discussing this obstetric sleep apnea topic is because OSA certainly puts as a big clinical conundrum in what, in how we uh, treat our patients. Because if we look at uh, the dynamics of it, patients who are obese, they tend to have OSA, and then patients who are obese, they tend to have uh, hypertension. So when you treat obesity in a way you are treating both, and then I used obesity as a risk factor, but there are multiple other risk factors which are common in both. So whether OSA as well as hypertension, both are individual end products of the similar risk profile that we see, 
or whether OSA by itself is a determining factor for hypertension and other cardiovascular morbidities that we see, that, that, that picture doesn't become very clear in our clinical scenario, particularly when the ill effects related to OSA and the benefits associated with that, they both are over a significantly long term, except some behavioral changes, which you see it immediately, like somnolence and whatnot. For most of the others, they are over years and decades even. So, of course, studies also become quite difficult. So, when a person like uh, Praneet, the case example that I gave you, when this person comes to me after six months, let's say he has reduced his weight, he has got his lifestyle under control, and he's also using CPAP, and now his blood pressure is better on single antihypertensive drug. I don't know whether his blood pressure got better because uh, he started behaving himself, he lost his weight, or whether OSA therapy or CPAP therapy actually helped him. All these hypotheses of uh, hypoxia, hypercapnia related damage, endothelial dysfunction related damage, uh, sympathetic stimulation related to renin, renin angiotensin stimulation, uh, obliterating that night dipper physiology that typically we see in patients who have sleep apnea. All of these hypotheses are very well studied and very well understood. What is not well understood is whether OSA is the target for this therapy or whether OSA is one of the end product of what we are already seeing. And that is fundamentally the reason I'm just trying to play devil's advocate here so that we can start the discussion based upon this, understanding whether we should be aggressively uh, targeting every OSA patient with every AHI cutoff, that is why I chose the number 32 in this case, because that comes literally, it's not 60 or it's not 80, whether we should be aggressively targeting each of them to expect the kind of clinical benefit that we want the patient to have. Uh, we have to understand that in the common population, OSA is very, very common, particularly in urban setting. If we have to quote some numbers, there could be anywhere from 10 to 20% of entire population uh, versus if you look at the incidence of pulmonary hypertension, they may not be 20% in the population. And if you look at selective subset like uh, patient hypertensive or patients who have heart disease, there the incidence of OSA is even higher, maybe 40, 50, 60%. I don't know based upon uh, which population you take. So I hope I'm getting the premise uh, to the audience in terms of what we are trying to discuss and why we are trying to discuss. So. Um, since I can't see any hands uh, raised up, I'm just going to ask uh, opinion from some of the very senior guys who are here in the audience. Uh, let me see, I have Dr. Sai Vittal. Dr. Sai Vittal was there with us in the last session as well. Sir, I'm unmuting you. If you could just share your thoughts on this particular case and to what I said in terms of OSA treatment, how do you perceive it and how aggressive you become in your clinical practice, your thought process, Dr. Sai Vittal. Thank you, sir. Good evening. You've given a very excellent record of the case. As you have already told uh, that it's a severe uh, case of a frequent ticket to severe because more than 30 AHA episodes are there. And the hypoxemia is also as good as apnea in this case. It does not contribute anything to the oxygenation. And in this case, CPAP is the ideal treatment of choice as you have told. And the body mass index of the 32. I would in addition go for a thyroid profile also in this case, in addition to what uh, already been done. And the CPAP, with CPAP the patient should respond very well. And uh, But the CPAP should be a sleep guided CPAP instead of a routine CPAP then because the, the, actually the settings will be varying very much. So putting the patient under the guidance of a CPAP uh, sleep study guided CPAP is more beneficial in this case. That's what I think. And hypertension in this case is usually refractory in these cases of uh, this hypertensive, this uh, obstructive sleep apnea is usually hypertension will be refractory. But in these cases, it may respond uh, once we put the patient on a CPAP. CPAP plus antihypertensive treatment plus, as you have told, uh, ma managing the obesity also. And obesity, as you have told, sir, probably we are under reporting obesity also. I concur with uh, our Dr. Pawan Reddy and uh, our uh, uh, Pranit. Thank you so much, sir, for your thought process. 
In the audience, we also have uh, Dr. B. Somaraju. Uh, Dr. Somaraju needs no introduction. Uh, sir, I'm unmuting you. If I could just get your thought process about the patient and about OSA as a general in terms of how aggressively you approach this and your thought process behind it. Dr. Somaraju. Anup, uh, thank you for asking me. And uh, uh, I, uh, we, we, we walked together and you saw when we walked together for a while in our patient also that uh, we go out of the way to ask uh, patients uh, sleep pattern. Sleep is uh, more important than what to do during daytime. Uh, seven to eight hours of sleep is fundamental for a healthy living. And uh, uh, in our Asian uh, population, the obesity is not essential to have sleep apnea, unlike in the West. Uh, <clears throat> it's well documented, actually. And uh, secondly, there is no system in the body which is not affected by after two sleep apnea or sleep disorders. And uh, after two sleep apnea is a, uh, almost like a uh, dustbin diagnosis of a, so many entities are involved in it. It is in a variety of forms, and uh, to try to oversimplify it, we call it after two sleep apnea. But uh, sleep disorders are enormously variegated, and uh, they have significant influence on every part of the body, right from the brain to lower limbs. Even for right from, when I say lower limbs, it's restless legs. And uh, lower limb symptoms too, you know, cognition and everything from the brain. Other systems I won't uh, uh, elaborate, except telling you not to be asking about the patient's sleep pattern is inadequate medicine. And uh, also, secondly, Obesity uh, is not a single disease again. The patient's lifestyle, you said, is a software engineer. How many hours he sits on a chair? And what is his uh, physical activity versus exercise? Physical activity is different from exercise. And uh, physical activity are moving about without even ordinary formal exercise uh, contributes to almost 30% of uh, obesity. Uh, so, we are going to some details. Most of these patients, not only a cardiologist or a physician, they need psychological counseling and behavioral therapy, and they have to be followed up closely, either physically or, to, uh, or any other time. And it is important that one of the members of the team in the outpatient call them every week and remind them about, uh, as somebody already pointed out, the use of the uh, say CPAP or uh, the diet and other things. It is an enormously serious disorder. It contributes to not only lack of control of hypertension, lack of control on diet, obesity, diabetes, and everything. Thank you, Anu. Sir, I just have one question for you before I let you go on this particular topic. Uh, with all the patients that you have treated with uh, CPAP, uh, the target clinical response, how much do you think is contributed by CPAP therapy alone as compared to everything else that you do, including behavioral therapy, including pharmacotherapy? Uh, I'm talking about clinical benefit per se. How much do you think CPAP contributes to that, sir? CPAP benefit is uh, significant and enormous, actually. And, uh, but other, all other factors are as important. Some of them actually they start losing weight after using CPAP and uh, they lose weight and then the need for CPAP comes down or it may disappear also sometimes. Uh, CPAP is so important. Perfect. Thank you so much, sir. I'm just going to uh, go around the list and ask other people but they, for their thought process and uh, for the risk of uh, repeating myself. Again, the whole point of discussion is should we use AHI or the uh, the numbers that we get on the sleep study as a target for therapy, or should we use CPAP as or should we use OSA as one of the endpoints of all the risk factors that we're talking about? So I'm not going to cite all the studies, but I'm just going to tell you a few things which I learned in my training program. Uh, few people study to say that if you control for weight loss and weight loss related blood pressure benefit, then, then CPAP related 
blood pressure response doesn't seem to gain statistical significance. Now, again, these studies are difficult to conduct. They are typically done over two, three, four years versus CPAP therapy sometimes needs years and maybe even decade to show any effect. Uh, so the more we start controlling other factors, when we look for the clinical outcome, we realize that the contribution of CPAP for that particular clinical entity, at least in the observational trials that we have done, and uh, mind you, I don't think there is any good randomized trial that is there in the science so far. Uh, the, the, the numbers don't seem to be that favorable to CPAP, and that is the reason why I believe the guidelines or the societies are not that aggressive about it. Uh, not because there is bad data, but just because we don't have enough good data. And that is where this is one field where uh, science-wise or uh, biochemical-wise, it makes sense to approach the CPAP. It is just that uh, we, we don't have good numbers to get by. As far as weight loss is concerned, in fact, this is also so much up in the air. There is so much discordant data. Uh, in fact, if you go back in the, in the data set and start looking into patients who wear CPAP actually gain weight rather than losing weight. People who lose weight on CPAP, they are actually getting their life under control. They are behaving themselves. They are watching what they're eating. They are doing exercise. So it's all part and parcel. It's like the orchestra where everything is working at the same time. Uh, but if you tell patients not to do anything else different except wear a CPAP, then actually patients gain a little bit of weight because now they are getting a good sleep, their sympathetic system is not that stimulated, their anabolic hormones are working better than their catabolic hormones, and eventually they end up gaining weight because their body feels good. On the other hand, what Dr. Somaraju sir said is, every single patient whom we see who, who behaves with CPAP machine, they end up losing weight because they are getting their life straight. They are eating right, they are working hard now, they are following your routine, they are doing all of this. So they all come as a part and parcel. And that is what we are trying to discuss. I am a strong believer that OSA should be treated and we should hit them hard. It is just that I don't have good answers to the patient in terms of objective numbers, what science would support us. So let us continue with this discussion. I'm going to ask a few more people about their impression about this particular entity and uh, treating the patient with hypertension. Uh, Dr. Vikas Reddy, I'm unmuting you. Dr. Reddy, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you're able to hear us and followed our thought process so far. I am inviting your suggestions on this topic. Dr. Reddy. Uh, yes, sir, actually, I will also go with the other, sir. Uh, the CPAP treatment is very essential for control of hypertension. Uh, one more thing is, uh, rather than simply advising the CPAP, uh, the duration of CPAP is very important. That is, for at least uh, four to six hours, CPAP has been shown to reduce the incidence of uh, uh, hypertension. So one more thing I would like to know is, uh, from the sleep study, uh, whether they have mentioned what is the duration of apnea and hypertension episodes during the REM sleep or not, sir? Because uh, it is quite common to mention uh, the episode in the REM as well as in the non-NREM sleep. Yeah, Dr. Reddy, thank you so much. I unfortunately don't have that particular information with me in terms of how much was it in the REM, how much was it in the non-REM. I have the report in front of me, so I can just go to that report, but I can't give you in a second. I'll maybe give you towards uh, the later half of the discussion. Let me invite other people's thought. Dr. Chandra Mukhe, she is one of our cardiologists at Care Banjara with special expertise on non-invasive cardiology. Dr. Chandra Mukhi, what is your thought process on this? I'm unmuting you. Good evening, all. Yeah, I agree with others that uh, we definitely should target uh, sleep apnea because uh, in this case, the uncontrolled hypertension may be because of the sleep apnea, and we need to address this. And uh, also, at the same time, lifestyle modification is also as important as uh, CPAP. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, before, uh, before I let you go, I have two very quick questions for you. If yeah. this patient asks uh, that, ma'am, if I take CPAP regularly, do you think my antihypertensive medication requirement will go down? What will be your answer? Yeah, definitely. Once uh, the sleep apnea is treated with the help of CPAP, then the medication 
and the dosage of the medication will also come down once the sleep apnea is treated perfect and my second quick question to you is if this patient takes a daytime nap do you think he should wear cpap during daytime as well uh, i'm not sure about that but definitely nocturnal cpap is uh, very helpful regarding the daytime i'm not sure i would like to take others opinion pulmonologist uh, opinion i will like to take on this perfect thank you so much ma'am uh, dr b shankar i am inviting your thoughts on this in terms of how do you approach osa in your clinical practice and how aggressive you become to these ahi numbers dr shankar i am unmuting you good evening uh, i am thankful to everybody uh, i joined purposefully because uh, i want to learn from my teachers uh, like uh, dr somraj since my undergraduate days uh, uh see cpap uh, most of the people they feel a little, little discomfort in our uh, district areas uh district zones uh it is very difficult to manage them. but can we can anybody in the audience enlighten us uh, with any permanent procedures like uh, surgical procedures like uppp or uh, any uh, mandibular devices Uh, other than cpap uh, uh, i want to know from the audience the learned audience perfect thank you so much sir we have dr rafi joining us dr rafi i hope you are able to hear us i am unmuting you uh, sir i will catch you up with whatever we have discussed so far dr rafi is a pulmonologist at care hospital banjara hills uh, sir we are discussing a patient who is 42 year old and he has got uh, hypertension and he has got sleep apnea with a ahi of 32 and uh, all of the audience here they said they are going to recommend cpap to this person for both his daytime somnolence symptom benefit as well as for his blood pressure control what is your take on this do you think this patient needs cpap and if you do think he needs cpap how would you go go about it please give us your expert view on this Dr. Rafi, um, see, already uh, HI seems to be high, uh, and then I think uh, this patient actually uh, needs a sp split night study. Hello, I, I am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are very much audible, and we heard you said sleep night study. If you could just tell our audience what is sleep night study. and everything that you do in your expertise split, split night it. study is something which is like if he is tolerating usually split night study is the one usually people who are already coming back with with with, with some kind of home studies with an ahi showing high and then there is a you know saturation dip below 80 or 85 those are the ones actually have to be picked up and then uh, put it for us split in titrate their uh, you know cpap measures which is like the lowest and best which we give under which it usually plays like centimeters of the water in the lower pressure 10 on the higher side usually we keep that range in a cpap also older cpap usually you manually has to be set up Yeah, the any clinician to order right, and then from one step patient come forward. So usually he needs a hospital setup, like sleep study, which is a split night. Would actually our technician would do manually seeing the uh, saturation dip where it is maximal, and then correcting to the uh, pressures and. Dr Rafi you seem to be at a unstable internet network is it possible for you to get into a more stable network which yeah, like if, uh, uh, if his cardiac it? condition is there you would have to go ahead I, i'm assuming that he is on a decongestive uh, medication as well so yeah that's how i approach does that answer your question i think anything in, because i joined late i am 
probably have missed a lot of discussion. Sure, sir, you answered most of the question. First of all, your internet network seems to be a bit unstable. Is it possible for you to get onto a slightly better network? Okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Just that uh, uh, the voice keeps interrupting. Hello. Okay. Yes, sir. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. We can yeah. absolutely hear you. So we heard you about slip night study. We heard you about the four centimeter and 10, 10 centimeter settings that you put for the CPAP. Uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions, few of them uh, asked by the audience and few of my own. Uh, difference between auto PAP and CPAP. What do you do in your patients? Hello? Rafi, sir, can you hear me? Auto, auto PAP versus CPAP. Yeah. Auto PAP versus CPAP, what do you do in your patients? Yeah, auto PAP versus CPAP. Yeah, auto PAP versus CPAP. Yeah. Auto CPAP. So okay. automatically pressure. Uh, patients breathing. Pressure actually needed to keep the airways open to a certain level where the easy breathing happens. That's what we can think uh, as measured as a of H2O pressure. The breathing tone of the uh, airway muscles should maintain as a um, you know negative pressure. So I think usually you if it needing more than that, obviously we need a some the patients when you see they are needing anywhere between eight to ten centimeters of pressure uh, so that means like they are not around four keep the airway open that is when i think this cpap helps giving a positive pressure to the muscles at there at their lowest are are the most relaxed sleep is when happens in the third leg of their uh, sleep time. Usually you see a maximal dip in these situations as well. So um, versus CPAP, if you're asking manual CPAP versus auto CPAP. Now I think auto CPAP is out of the question in most of the practice. It is always an auto CPAP. Yeah, perfect, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, I'm, I'm going to mute you now. We just continue with our discussion. Uh, let's see. Dr. Pawan, if I could just have you join again. I'm Dr. Pawan, I am unmuting you, Dr. Pawan Reddy. I have a question for you, which was asked by our uh, audience member. The role of surgical correction in C in obstructive sleep apnea treatment. Do you ever prescribe? What What is your take on it? Uh, like Dr. Swamaraj sir has already said, it is not just a single anatomical problem. There are a lot of things contributing to it, uh, to uh, sleep apnea symptom. So we call it uh, different names. We call them sleep apnea. We say obesity, hypoventilation, obstructive sleep apnea. So you have different, different terminologies being used because you can have a guy with obesity presenting. You may not have, you may have a thin guy who may present with uh, the similar kind of uh, syndrome. So uh, it is not always anatomical problem that you need correction by doing some service. Yes, if somebody has a longer uh, uvula, which is obstructing uh, the posterior pharynx of the patient is actually sleeping, you may suggest uvulopalatopharyngoplasty. If somebody has a, let's say, retrognathia, where the jaw is actually, the lower jaw is not aligning with the upper jaw, but uh, or is it a you can do some mandibular corrective surgery. So it depends on anatomical structural problem. If you have a structural problem, you can you can look at it. So we have a famous example of a Delhi CM who used to have a constant cough because his uvula was always a little longer. He went for a surgery for that. So if you if you have those kind of anatomical issues, then there is a chance of doing some sort of a surgery. But if it is because of neck tone, most of the time what happens is lifestyle uh, you know issues like somebody who drinks uh, every day before going to sleep 
uh, or somebody is a smoker. Smokers have this uh, pharyngeal edemas, bronchitis. Uh, there is an there is an anatomical problem is not uh, solved by any surgery there. So you have an edema, mucosal edema, uh, that is the cause there, or a lateral edema is the cause. Uh, drinkers, alcohol under the influence of sedatives, narcotics, or if you are taking any hypnotics or something like alcohol uh, before sleep, the alcohol causes the loss in the tone of the muscles of the neck muscles. So that causes a little collapse of the, um, the pharyngeal muscles. So the airway is actually narrowed there. So there are different different reasons, and not you cannot correct all of them by using uh, surgical methods. So each uh, individual patient is different. Uh, you have to understand that process and then go over what. If it's an obese patient, uh, if he has a bigger tongue, uh, if he's got a shorter mouth, each person is different in that uh, way the uh, patient presents. In. So you have to look at what is the cause, uh, if there is anything that you can do. So we always think that if you can do a surgery and get away with it for permanently, it is the best. But that, that is not the condition in most of the cases. In majority of the cases, um, what we see is obesity. Then the second thing is use of some sort of a medical drugs like uh, alcohol or uh, nicotine smoking. Uh, these are the causes that cause this problem. So I think we need to address each patient independently and see what we can do best. And Dr. Pawan, since I have you here uh, from the critical care standpoint, if you could just for the completion sake tell our audience what is the difference between home BiPAP versus home CPAP? Sometimes you prescribe BiPAP at home. What are the fundamental differences between the two? See, uh, CPAP, like you said, um, CPAP is a continuous positive airway pressure. When we say CPAP, that is where we traditionally say that there is only one pressure that is there with, before, within, I mean, during the expiration phase and also inspiration phase. So this is something. If you selectively talk about only expiratory phase, we call it end, post, end expiratory positive pressure. So EPAP, we say EPAP in this terminology, which in a ventilator term, we call the PEEP. When we're talking about a ventilator, we call it PEEP. On the machine, we call it an EPAP, that is during expiratory positive airway pressure. In the inspiratory, uh, in the inspiratory cycle, uh, if it is the same pressure that you're being contributed, when we call it as CPAP. That is, if you put a setting of, let's say, five centimeters of water, this is the pressure that is being administered, the amount of air, the, the, the air is pushed into your pharynx uh, at a constant pressure. This constant pressure is, let's say, five centimeters of water. If it is there, both during inspiration and expiration, that is continuously you are giving the same amount of pressure, we call it as a CPAP. If it is given five only during expiration, and during inspiratory cycle, which is sensed by the machine, that there is a trigger, that is that there's a flow drop or a pressure drop when you start to initiate a breath. And then the, then the machine understands that the patient is taking a trigger or the patient is taking a breath. Then the pressure shoots up to give him some more additional pressure. So this we call it an IPAP. That is during inspiration, you have a different setting. So EPAP will be five, IPAP may be 10, 12, whatever. So that is different. So there are two different levels of PEEP that you are setting. So one is, when we say PEEP, PEEP is like positive end expiratory pressure. So you are giving it in the expiratory cycle. But when we say BiPAP, so there are two levels of, uh, you know, positive airway pressures. So by level of positive. See, BiPAP traditionally um, is actually a mode of uh, respironics company. So it is basically a trade name. Okay, BiPAP is actually a trade name. So it is not actually a mode. You can call it bi-level pressure support, actually, or a BIPS. So because there is a lot of terminology, these things, so we understand that BiPAP, CPAP, uh, EPAP. CPAP is continuous presence of same pressure during expiration and inspiration. If you use two different pressures, one in inspiration, one in expiration, uh, two different setting or levels, then we traditionally now is routinely call them as BiPAP. So that is the difference. Now, oh, no. when you look at the I just wanted to add something here before I forget. Sir. One is, uh, is ex extremely important not to take the patient's uh, history for granted, absence of snoring. You must ask the sleeping partner. Usually the wife, or it may be somebody else. 
always we will need to call them at home and ask number one number two we aware that it is one of the very important causes of unexplained chronic cough because the dryness of the mouth etc just wanted to add this and then thank you uh thank you sir sir uh, i don't want if if you could stick on for another 10 15 minutes i actually wanted to come back to you for some questions once dr pawan reddy is done uh, i would come back to you if, uh, with some questions yes dr pawan if you could just finish yourself in the next minute or two dr pawan sir so so this is the difference we talk about cpap and bipap so when we traditionally use cpap uh, cpap is something a continuous positive airway pressure that is enough to keep your there is some sort of a positive pressure that you are giving either through the upper airways which can be transmitted all the way up to the alveoli so for example cpap is two things that we use one is during sleep apnea and for pulmonary edema so where in pulmonary edema you have the pulmonary venous pressure in, is higher than the alveolar pressure so fluid actually hydrostatically moves into the lungs if you are increasing the alveolar pressure by exerting a positive airway pressure the hydrostatic pressure is reversed so where the alveolar pressure is higher than the venous pressure that's what you are trying to achieve by using a cpap and pulmonary edema same way if when you are giving a positive airway pressure which is a continuous during inspiration during expiration when you are giving it you are basically opening up the upper airway in a positive sleep apnea bipap where you require a two level cpap or two level of peep is basically when we use is most commonly used for copd patients now in copd patients you know there are like the puffers right you see those patients they kind of lip part slip breathing is there when they are trying to exhale that's basically because they have to increase the expiratory time they need an expiratory time increase expiratory time because either the bronchi are constricted they need more time for emptying out the alveoli because you have a narrower airways so in that setting you are trying to uh, give them more time during exhalation and using a higher uh, uh, to decrease their work of breathing so what that we do is generally we use a two different levels of uh, uh, positive airway pressure that is for copd for an obstructive sleep apnea cpap is enough for pulmonary edema cpap is enough occasionally we go for a bipap it's an added extra pressure that you are trying thank you so much uh, dr pavan uh, uh, dr somaraj sir i actually had few uh, particular questions which i'm sure the audience would uh, benefit from your thought process and i will share this uh, 42 year old patient story that uh, i had so this patient i actually saw him a uh, couple of months later again and this time he brought with him a functional mri report he was seen by one of the ent specialist in the city i can't recollect the name a functional mri uh, functional mri was done of his upper airway and there was some degree of stenosis during um, uh, breathing that was noted and uh, they were in the process of uh, planning a surgical correction of sleep apnea and this was the question which was uh, brought in by one of the audience members as well so sir i want to uh, get your opinion in terms of other than cpap what all therapy options that uh, you have tried in your patients with what kind of success any role of uh, uh, awakening drugs like uh, modafinil or those kind of things, anything that you found helpful other than CPAP machine? And what is your thoughts on uh, the surgical correction? Dr. Somaraju, I'm unmuting you. Okay. Uh, surgery has very little role. That functional MRI is not reliable until uh, you correct his physiological abnormality. And secondly, and uh, loss of weight, not only loss of weight, Suppose you are giving a diuretic to somebody with hypertension and obesity and sleep apnea, it's better to give a diuretic which is longer acting like clozaldone rather than thysate. Because late night uh, edema is prevented by, or sometimes give a diuretic in the latter part of the day or evening than in the morning. And uh, surgery has very little role. Functional MRI doesn't uh, say it is an obstruct to pathological abnormality. It can uh, produce the abnormality in ordinary sleep apnea also. So don't go by that, that's one. And secondly, uh, say absence of snoring, actually, I'm sorry, before I go to that, uh, uh, say 
uh, you uh, other methods of uh, dealing with them actually other devices that are used generally are proven to be not greatly effective and uh, you take the opinion of others uh, also but i found that the other devices uh, are of not great help except uh, i find in some of the patients make them feel side to side and i have to use a pillow to be able to do that and uh, tell their sleeping partner also to make sure that they sleep like that uh, sleep into the side and absence of snoring doesn't rule out uh, say sleep apnea be aware of it and uh, as i said earlier it is one of the causes which often are not realized as causes of chronic cough because they have dry mouth and uh, it predisposes to recurrent chronic cough and anything else you want to ask me you can ask sir do you recommend cpap for the daytime as well when they sleep yes whenever they sleep yes and secondly sir, in the absence of uh, cpap they should not be given drugs for a uh, say sedatives because that aggravates uh, sleep apnea and uh, drugs uh, which produce awakening they have enormous variety of side effects we should not use them sir have you ever suggested your patient to go for surgery for sleep uh, for osa have you ever done that in any of the only one patient in the last uh, maybe more than 10 years and what was the kind of response in that patient sir? Uh, changed with obstruction and uh, other problems sir. okay perfect um, any any audience member if they have any other questions for somaraju sir uh, we have five more minutes for here uh, rafi sir i just want to bring you in last time your network was a bit issue let's try and see this time rafi sir i am unmuting you uh if you could just give us some uh, overview of other devices for sleep apnea other than os other um, other than cpap what is your thought do they work do they not work are they all gimmick um selectively i think they are shown to be working like you know there is one which uh, um you know people who breathe like a uh, oral breathing kind and lifts up so that the breath with more of a dent dentists uh, kind of gadgets which they used in the s breathers another thing is kids who annoyed those kind of patients um also that there is a you know continuous nose blocks there are pins which keep in in the nostril lobe. and these are these are being tried which are like a very little uh during the phase of usually going through any secondary blockage and all uh they might have helped for brief period of time but i think i doubt on a longer term whether they would be really helpful uh one thing when you are talking about the surgical corrections i think uh, indirect surgical corrections like we have seen nonors and coming back some airway uh, nasopharyngeal area corrections have been done like a simple um, you know long which have made and uh, shown in anger lot who are seems to be showing like high ahi when you do a sleep studies have been uh, corrected and then get got back to normal sleep but other than that in a elder age group i doubt the gadgets are really help and perfect thank you yeah perfect thank you so much sir and sir before i let you go just one more thing and i wish your network was just a little bit better sir when we when we give cpap to patients how do we monitor whether it's actually working or not at uh, monitor the uh, patients who are on uh, cpap we need to see the auto titration report that is one thing which tells us like if his initial ahi in the uh, has been uh, normalized or not with the at least uh, about an interval of 3 weeks to start with and as a first interval after 3 weeks and then after i think every 3 months is the one but i think there is a catch to it uh, with 
without doing lifestyle modifications, people tend to get comforted with the CPAP. And then uh, after three months, patient comes back with uh, not just the initial weight, but the more gain in the weight. And then um, is still using CPAP. And then his AHI starts increasing. I mean, auto titration report won't show the normalized AHI. Uh, these kind of patients are also there. I think it's a CPAP has to be blended with the lifestyle modifications. Uh, then only I think it's beneficial. So the follow-up is usually with the thyroid profile, um, baseline ABG in the morning hours, and then auto titration report. These are the three things I think essentially guide you to plan in each three months. And sir, do the commercially available CPAP machine, all of them have a memory card slot, or this is only uh, for some other machines? Like all of them? No, no nowadays, 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 all the machines. I think we would suggest a high-end ones only, which have machines that too as i said initially no more uh, you know manual titrations so i think auto cpaps and then with the memory card uh, that is the best way to go perfect thank you so much rafi sir and uh, you know rafi sir's network unfortunately was uh, leaving us with a little bit more desire so just i'll complete it most of these machines they do have a memory card slot where patients should put a memory card if you don't put a memory card there won't be data and almost all the machines, they have got uh, softwares available online, which you can download on your computer, which will read the uh, report. And it actually, it will give you the report and it will tell you whether uh, uh, the compliance and how, how frequently they are using and uh, whether the AutoPAP settings are good enough, whether you want to change the settings. We didn't have time to go over some of the other settings of the CPAP, particularly the ramp setting versus patio setting and all this. Uh, that we can certainly discuss later. Uh, anybody has any thoughts, questions, comments, or anything to suggest for this? We are at we are 8:30 right now. Uh, please feel free to um, share your thoughts. Uh, Dr. Somaraju, sir, you have joined the huddle for the first time. Typically, I ask uh, the new joinee to share their thought process about this model of clinical discussion. Uh, Somaraju, sir, I am unmuting you. If you could just give us some constructive criticism or how to make it better. Uh, Somaraju, sir. See, uh, it's, uh, uh, I enjoyed it. Actually, I joined it first time. It was extremely important. It's a very important area, particularly sleep apnea. Uh, as a rule, if you ask me, uh, typically an average uh, patient walks into doctor's clinic. Uh, sleep apnea is often missed. It's an extremely important area, and uh, it's increasing actually even in our Asian countries. And as I said, uh, there is no need for the patients to be obese to have sleep apnea. And it affects all parts of the body. And I think if you ask me this model of discussion, uh, it's uh, extremely useful. And uh, uh, I enjoyed it. And uh, please continue this, and it's very useful. And sir, if you even offline, if you have anything to suggest us to make this better, please, we are uh, we are really receptive of anybody giving us suggestions on how to make it better. Um, we are learning on the go. As I said, this is we are doing it for about six months now, but we still think we are learning uh, every single time. Yeah, uh, I, uh, uh, no. Yes, sir. My uh, suggestion for um, my own colleagues, I talk to them. And I've been talking about it for a while. Is while you are talking about medicine, medicine is the super science of man. And uh, the idea for all of us should be not only topics related to so called uh, medicine, but also the, uh, uh, the it, it involves a wider knowledge of all other sciences that includes. Uh, so I will say uh, it is the uh, symphony of profound knowledge of all, what all human beings that involved. That includes uh, physics, chemistry, uh, information technology, sciences, and social sciences, management skills, leadership, teamwork. Please include those topics, and I will be enjoying it more. Next, like uh, the idea of all this is. Medicine is in a, just like any other profession, medicine particularly is in, a, in danger 
of uh, deterioration in different forms and uh, to cure medicine medicine alone medical topics alone won't help talk widely and uh, make it the super science of man namely the profound knowledge and uh, symphony of profound knowledge then only you can be a good clinician medicine alone is not enough that's what i wanted to suggest thank you thank you so much for the feedback sir we actually in our 25 sessions we uh, i believe four sessions we did which were directly non clinical we talked about uh, quality control in drugs we talk we talked about financial investments we talked about uh, uh, why is reading outside of medicine important we talked about uh, career option uh, one of the one of the feedback that we got uh, and it is kind of unfortunate that uh, our uh, attendance or our audience participation for those sessions were the least so we did try to include them and i fundamentally agree with you that we should be involving more of these so what i'm trying to do is i'm trying to do three four clinical topics and after that put in one of those topics so that my ego also gets satisfied actually when you ask me when you tell me that the attendance for those sessions was poor that is exactly the reason why we should do it more yes yes and absolutely I used to say when we took classes in uh, they when we were in medical college uh, and hospitals and uh, even uh, we used to take say classes and uh, then say even one student is enough sometimes we say half student because if that one student is sleeping <laughs> so that's how medicine today is go ahead good one about number of people it's not easy to change the world overnight uh dr shankar you have something to say i am unmuting you please please uh, you can share your thought dr shankar i really appreciate dr somraj's uh, move uh, uh, there is one entity known as uh, central sleep apnea uh, how it is uh, different from uh, obstructive sleep apnea can anybody enlighten me central sleep apnea especially we Perfect. come across in uh, congested heart failure uh, in those cases we see but how it is a different and how to differentiate it uh, from sen uh, obstructive sleep apnea perfect uh, pawan sir i thought you had some i thought briefly your hand was up if you want to share your thoughts and if you want to take this question as well dr pawan i am unmuting you uh, yeah so basically i want to talk about the surgical aspect of this Speaking about surgical aspects, uh, we were talking about the local ones. There is one more surgery that indirectly helps. That is in super obese. When we talk about super obese, the bariatric surgical techniques uh, will help them in losing weight, and then when you see them, these the people go down on their uh, sleep apnea issues. Now, central sleep apnea is something yeah, like heart failure, stroke patients, or sometimes uh, some patients who. who live in high altitude area they can also have these kind of thing uh so basically it, it it presents a similar kind of a situation where you will have more amount of uh, uh these things happen but uh, um, the basically difference is that the type of breathing will be different you may see something like a a chain stroke breathing we call it right uh you you uh, you can uh, you remember that way there will be a faster breathing and then suddenly you will have a, a dip in the way the patient hypoventilation starts and so there is always an alternative alternating uh, hyperventilation and hypoventilation that kind of thing too now central is also because of drugs sometimes so somebody is taking uh, something like opioids like codeine mom Pawan sir, we lost you now. Not able to hear for the last three four seconds. Pawan sir, we are not able to hear you. Uh, sir, I'm going to mute you. I'll just finish this uh, answer and then we'll close it because we are already running short of time. So, Shankar sir, to answer your question first, that uh, what uh, Pawan sir already uh, answered in the central sleep apnea, the problem is that the brain, and most of the time, there is a secondary cause for it. It could be heart failure, it could be steatonarcosis, it could be physiological multiple times, like high altitude or whatnot. 
So many of the times uh, there is a correctable pathology that, that you can correct. How do we diagnose it? Uh, in a typical sleep study, they put uh, uh, measurements on the chest wall as well to try and see whether the patient is making a breathing movement or not. So whenever there is an apnea episode, which is recorded by the sleep study, they also see if there is breathing movement associated with it. In the central sleep apnea, there will be apnea and there won't be any body's attempt to make a breathing movement. So apnea and absence of breathing movement, they both will be concurrent and that would be suggesting a central episode as compared to an obstructive or a peripheral episode where there is actual airway constriction, where the body is trying to overcome that uh, resistance and trying to breathe uh, more. So uh, that kind of pattern, you will see it in the sleep study. You don't have to do any extra study for that. Uh, understandably, that central sleep apnea in a random case is much lower incidence. Typically, you will see it in some sort of setup, and there typically is a reversible cause. Unfortunately, the treatment for both of them has to be CPAP because even if it is central sleep apnea, you don't want patients to have apnea episode for longer period of time. So while you treat the reversible episode, you also put them on CPAP machine so that uh, their breathing, their apnea episodes, their hypoxia episodes, uh, nighttime they get better while you also treat their uh, reversible cause. I hope that uh, that answered the question about the central, how to differentiate and how to treat. Uh, if there is any other questions, comments, or thought process, uh, maybe next 20, 30 seconds, we will take over. Uh, Praneet, your closing comment on the session about uh, what we discussed and anything you want to add. Uh, so it was a, a good session. Thank you, everyone, for that uh, input. So a lot of uh, things learned regarding the uh, how to diagnose or interpret a uh, uh, sleep uh, study report and what are the various uh, therapies available and equally discussing about uh, surgical techniques in selected few and also differentiating at the end with uh, central and obstetric sleep apnea. So it was a uh, good session indeed like uh, the previous sessions as well and uh, it's been 25 weeks which was uh, amazing. Uh, time really flied and I enjoyed each and every session and it was a good learning experience and it gives you confidence when you practice and when you uh, see uh, sit in OPD and uh, with the patient in front asking you questions, you have more confidence to answer them with whatever that you have learned through these sessions. So it's been an amazing journey and I hope we continue this. Thank you, Praneet. And uh, thank you for all the attendees for attending today's session. A special thanks to my guests, particularly Dr. Rafi, Dr. Pawan, Dr. Somaraju sir for joining us for the first time. Uh, to our attendees, we would like your feedback. I, I already uh, said this. If you find anything that we can make it better, please let us know. If you found the session worthwhile, maybe request you to share it to other colleagues so that uh, more and more people can join and uh, more and more people can share their thought. The weekly huddle is hosted every Wednesday. Uh, the link to join are static, which means the same link will work for the upcoming sessions as well. You don't need a new link. You don't need a new password, although we will send you that every week. But even if you have an old link, you should be able to join. Uh, the, all the huddle sessions are recorded and the recordings are available on podcast on YouTube. You can simply just search the weekly huddle and you will get it, even the past recordings. The quality is not very good, but you will get the gist of it. And if you are interested in a particular recording, just email it to me and I will uh, share you that as well. I thank you all again for your time and participation. Uh, if nobody has any other thoughts to add, uh, I thank all of you. Good night and we will see you next week. Thank you guys.